Uh, we're trying out a new streaming thing here, so bear with us as we figure things out. <coughs> Okay, so yes, uh, weather balloons and you, a guide to your first weather balloon launch. Um, Would you introduce yourself? And I'm Mike, I run the hackerspace and I've done many, many weather balloon launches, uh, probably at this point on the order of 30 or more uh, over the last several years. Uh, I also make and sell an open source weather balloon tracker that I developed um, and we're on version two and Work has begun on version three. Um, so yeah, uh, weather balloons. <coughs> um, so why launch a weather balloon? Neat pictures is usually the most popular one. Uh, science, there's atmospheric weather data, cosmic particles, radiation, and so on. Um, amateur radio is also neat. Uh, some people just need an excuse for uh, messing around with amateur radio, uh, getting into digital modes and repeaters, so this is a good one. Um, fake internet points is also a popular reason, and also none of your le business and leave me alone. Uh, that's my personal favorite. Um, <coughs> so yeah, uh, you've decided to launch a weather balloon, what, what exactly you're going to need. Um, so required equipment, uh, obviously you're going to need a balloon. <coughs> uh, the size of the balloon and uh, the exact type uh, we'll go over a little later on, but it's going to depend on what you're launching and what your goals are. Uh, you'll need something to track the balloon uh, and ideally stream data or somehow get data back uh, and generally a backup tracker. Uh, you'll need a payload container, so something to sit underneath your balloon with all your stuff in it. Uh, rigging to connect your balloon to your payload. Uh, having a computer or smartphone uh, when you're doing the launch is very helpful uh, for running uh, simulations and um, also decoding data from your tracker. Uh, you'll need a lifting gas. Uh, helium is very popular because it's safe, uh, but it's also expensive. And then hydrogen is the alternative, which is much cheaper, but there's uh, a bit more flammability. <coughs> uh, you'll need a chase vehicle uh, if you want to get your balloon back. If you don't care about that, then you at least need to be able to drive out to where you're going to launch it from. Uh, zip ties and tape. Uh, you can never have enough, and then a general flight plan. Uh, ideally, you would file some forms, uh, no TAM, notice to airmen, uh, with your flight plan, but it's not strictly required, uh, assuming that uh, you're doing the unregulated class, which uh, is what I'm covering here. <coughs> uh, so we'll start with the flight plan. Uh, I like the Astra Planner. Uh, it's a uh, uh, open source uh, planner made available by um, some university in the UK. <coughs> and um, it's by far the easiest to use out of all of them. Uh, so while you're messing with your flight plan, uh, you'll want to kind of have it, or when you're coming up with your flight plan, have a general window. Uh, having one specific time and date uh, rarely works out the way you want it to and will often lead to uh, hasty decisions and some failures. Uh, so having a window is nice. Uh, running lots and lots of predictions, uh, starting probably a month out for the dates you're looking at, and you continue to do them on a regular basis right up until you actually let go. Um, <coughs> and uh, be flexible in your flight plan, so be prepared to change where you're launching from based on uh, where you want it to land. So uh, I ran a prediction last night if I was going to launch at 10 p.m. last night when I was putting this presentation together from my house, and you can see it wouldn't go great. There's a chance it might end up on the island, uh, but that wouldn't be the easiest thing to go retrieve. <coughs> um, so running the Astro Planner, these are the four things you're asked for. Uh, so on the left here, uh, well, my left, you're also left. Uh, <coughs> you're asked for uh, the date you're going to launch on and the time. Uh, below that, you're selecting your gas type, hydrogen and helium. They have slightly different lift capabilities, so that makes a difference. Uh, your balloon model. Again, there's uh, three or four very popular balloon models, um, and this covers the most popular uh, brands and sizes. Um, <coughs> the model's 
going to be your brand and then the size of the balloon, which is measured in grams. Uh, a parachute model, uh, it'll depend on your payload weight. Uh, I generally don't fly with parachutes because I fly such light payloads, but um, they're definitely an option. Uh, and then you set your payload weight. I generally fly about one kilo payloads. Uh, then your nozzle lift, which is the total lift of the balloon <coughs> uh, measured from the nozzle. So basically you're subtracting the weight of the balloon envelope uh, and your payload in order, uh, in order to get your nozzle lift. So if um, you had two kilo nozzle lift and a one kilo payload, you would end up with one kilogram of free lift which is what I generally shoot for. Um, and then your train equivalent sphere diameter, I have no idea what that means, and they just tell you to set it to a value between 0.1 and 3. So I always pick 0.2. Not entirely sure what it does. <coughs> uh, the next uh, screen over, uh, you set your launch site, and you can either set coordinates uh, from GPS, your current coordinate based on where your computer reports it is, or pick from a Google Map style map. Um, Next one over is your weather data. Uh, I just use the default the online forecast, which is pulling from weather NOAA, NOAA weather data uh, from previous weather balloon launches in the day. Um, and then the last one is your simulation settings. Uh, you can set how many simulations you want it to run. Uh, 10 to 20 is a good number. It's the, lo the more you have, the longer it's gonna take. And the flight type is generally standard. Uh, we'll cover that later on what that means, but the two options are standard and floating. Uh, so that's uh, running your predictions. <coughs> uh, so your balloon, uh, like I said earlier, size and type is going to depend on payload weight and flight goals. Um, a lot of people just go with the biggest balloon, which often is pretty unnecessary uh, and just uses more gas since you have a heavier balloon that you have to lift now. <coughs> um, so uh, I generally fly 300 gram balloons with my one kilo uh, payloads. Uh, if you're looking for bigger, uh, they go up to 2,000 gram balloons or the easy to find ones. Um, uh, and those are all extensible balloons or latex balloons. Uh, they're very inexpensive. They go up and eventually they're gonna pop because the pressure drops around them so they expand. <coughs> um, that's what most flights you're going to see are. Uh, there's also super pressure balloons. Uh, generally, these are going to be homemade. Uh, they're made from mylar or heptax or similar uh, very thin lightweight plastics uh, with multiple layers to seal the helium in. And super pressure uh, will reach a certain point in the uh, atmosphere where they are at equilibrium with the surrounding air pressure. Uh, generally 50 to 70,000 feet and they will just stay there. Uh, the gas will slowly leak out, of, leak out over the course of weeks, uh, days to weeks, um, and then it'll come down, but generally it'll just hit that one band and just cruise there. Um, you may see some variation uh, with night and day cycles as the temperature changes. Um, <coughs> and then the last type, uh, I've never actually seen an amateur fly this, but um, sure it's happened. There's zero pressure balloons, which means you have a big mylar um, container and there's a small vent at the bottom and all your helium sitting up at the top uh, until it reaches equilibrium and then it's more equally distributed and it starts to vent out the bottom so it'll hit a certain point in the atmosphere again and just kind of cruise at that altitude and uh, during the night and day cycle it'll actually dump helium uh, as it goes so they don't last quite as long as the super pressure. Uh, feel free to interrupt me with any questions. <coughs> um, so that's balloons. Um, next you have trackers. Uh, there's three kind of big families of trackers. Um, APRS is the most common. Uh, it's the most common worldwide, but especially in North America. Uh, some countries have specific regulations against flying amateur radio equipment and transmitting. Um, most notably the UK and a few others, but most countries are fine with APRS on a balloon. <coughs> um, satellite trackers like the uh, Spot 3 um, are very popular. They're expensive. Uh, it requires an annual subscription of uh, about $200. Um, 
they only uh, report once every 10 minutes. Um, and they're on the bigger and heavier side. It's got four AAAs inside of it. Um, they're very rugged, which is nice, but adds to the weight. Uh, and they also don't report above 60,000 feet uh, due to COCOM limitations. Um, uh, COCOM limitations, there's, uh, I forget exactly what it stands for, but it's a military limitations placed on GPS receivers that says uh, you can't operate above Mach 1 or 60,000 feet. And most GPS uh, manufacturers take that or to be an and, so it won't do either one. Um, so GPS selection is uh, kind of a challenge in order to find one that actually does the or correctly. Uh, and the last one is LoRa or similar um, uh, unlicensed band transmitters. Right. <coughs> um, uh, so LoRa is nice because you don't need a license. Uh, they're inexpensive and lightweight. Um, you have to have a receiver on the ground with line of sight to the transmitter. Um, <coughs> but uh, yeah, um, I guess I didn't put the pluses and minuses on APRS, but uh, APRS is nice because there's a whole series of repeaters around the world that are listening for these packets and they handle all the reception work so you don't have to have any extra ground equipment. It's nice to have, but it will do its own thing and you'll still get data back. Uh, people can also follow along in real time, which is nice. Um, oh, I did cover it on the next slide. I did this very late at night. <coughs> um, so APRS uh, is again line of sight, but since there's this repeater network, uh, once you're at altitude, you're covering a 400 mile radius circle on the ground. So you're bound to hit a repeater somewhere in there. Um, I've even had uh, reports from 600 miles away on flights. Um, <coughs> you can use sites like APRS.fi for real-time tracking and anybody that knows your call sign can go on there and track you in real time. Um, there's a big free network of repeaters uh, operated by amateurs. Um, if you, for some reason, can't hit a repeater, usually when it's on the ground, uh, there is the option to receive it directly with the handheld radio. Um, and you can directly decode it uh, for your location data. <coughs> uh, there's a lot of uh, open source and inexpensive, relatively inexpensive uh, APRS transmitters out there, as well as receivers. Um, <coughs> you can uh, include additional data in your APRS packets, like temperature, pressure, humidity, uh, which is what I include, um, and anything else you want to throw in that packet. I think you're limited to uh, a few hundred <coughs> K for the total packet size. So you only get so much, but uh, there is some flexibility there. <coughs> uh, the downsides are uh, you're going to need a ham radio license, but they're pretty easy to get. Um, then one of the other neat things is sites like APRS.fi uh, track all your data for you, and then you can easily dump it later um, in a KML or similar format, which you can then put directly into Google Earth and visualize, which is neat. Um, so this is some examples of data that I pulled out from a couple of flights. Uh, <coughs> the top left um, was near uh, Maricopa, and you can see it took a rather interesting uh, path there. Uh, this was during what's called the atmospheric turnaround where the jet stream switches directions and it happens over the course of a week or so. So you can see some neat patterns in it. Uh, the one on the bottom right is uh, actually from a team in Texas. And uh, I was able to pull their data uh, through APRS.fi and plot it and then make this 3D graph. Uh, so the color changes based on the altitude and you can see the 3D uh, as it, uh, when they initially launched it was very wet so everything was a lot heavier. And you can see it started to dry out and rise a little faster. Um, and then uh, here where it gets to the purple, it popped and comes down rather quickly. Um, so that's neat. <coughs> uh, things you can put in your payloads, uh, your tracker and backup tracker, um, which should go in an insulated box. Uh, I just use three quarter inch styrofoam that I had scrapped from uh, something else I bought and capped on tape together. Um, and then whatever additional stuff you want to run, uh, I've flown muon detectors, 
um, Geiger counters, uh, yeah, I mean, just whatever other stuff. And then cameras are always neat. Uh, I kind of got bored of the pictures, but you know, some people want to do that. So Canon's running the CHDK was neat. Um, CHDK is a custom firmware that lets you script what the camera does. So you can tell it, uh, set up an intervalometer. So take a picture every 30 seconds for the first 20 minutes and then take a video that's five minutes long every 10 minutes. And, you know, just script custom, custom things like that, which is really neat. Uh, or I like to use the Samsung Gear 360, which is just a very small, lightweight 360 camera. So you can get a full sphere of your flight. Uh, the only problem with those is uh, trying to stabilize it afterwards is very difficult. <clears throat> uh, so here's my example payload box. Like I said, just a piece of foam and some Kapton. Uh, the rigging I use is just uh, some Home Depot marking line with a 30 pound brake strength with a couple of um, fishing spinners on it. And the thing in the bottom right is the uh, balloon filler. So you have that hooked up to your regulator and goes into the nozzle on your balloon. Uh, just makes life a little easier. Helium? Uh, helium or hydrogen. Um, I've switched to hydrogen lately because it's a quarter of the price mm -hmm. uh, and Renewable. haven't exploded yet. <laughs> and there's also helium being a non-renewable. So it's that too. <coughs> um, uh, so when it's time to do your flight, uh, the old rule two is one and one is none so uh, as many things as you can double up on you should uh, I've said it a few times but tracker and backup tracker um, uh, so I generally I launched from Maricopa so uh, it's about a two-hour drive up there so I'll leave here at about six in the morning get there around eight and then if everything goes well I'll launch around ten um, so having that extra time to figure out things if something goes wrong is always nice uh, and the earlier you can launch the earlier you can recover and hopefully find the balloon while it's still daylight out <coughs> um, as soon as you get there uh, start filling your balloon it takes quite a while you don't want to fill it too quickly or you can damage the latex it's surprisingly thin um, and you're shooting for about a kilogram of free lift uh, I use a luggage scale uh, connected to um, the filler here down at the bottom um, to measure as a measurement point and that gives me a pretty good idea of when I've hit a kilogram of free lift um, <clears throat> uh, once that's done uh, you can just zip tie off the nozzle uh, and again I probably use four to six zip ties on it just to be extra sure um, connect your rigging to those zip ties uh, check all your electronics, making sure, make sure they transmit, run another predi final prediction before you let go, and then you let go. Uh, you'll get about one to three hours of flight time depending on some variables, um, wind, speed, and direction, uh, how much you filled your balloon, how much free lift you had. I generally shoot for uh, a, ki a kilogram of free lift, uh, which means a thousand foot a minute ascent rate. Uh, which guarantees your balloon will pop uh, and you get about an hour and a half to two hours flight round trip doing that <coughs> um, if you underfill your balloon uh, even with the latex balloon there is a small chance that it'll hit equilibrium and just coast and keep going <laughs> um, <coughs> so some accessories you might consider a uh, backup tracker an amateur radio is handy uh, luggage scale, binoculars, um, you can actually keep, assuming it's a clear day, you can keep track, visual track of the balloon the whole way up and down, which is kind of neat to see a little white speck at 100,000 feet. <coughs> um, a lighter is very nice if you uh, need to change your rigging or just being able to melt the ends of the strings together so they don't come apart. Um, diagonal cutters for your zip ties. Uh, hiking gear because you're generally wanting to do this somewhere remote uh, which means it'll probably land somewhere remote and you'll have to go get it uh, and a camera because the pictures on the ground are sometimes as much fun as the ones in the air 
<clears throat> so these are some photos from uh, prepping. Uh, top left there is a uh, small, I think, J-cylinder of helium uh, and some tarp just to keep everything clean as you work. <clears throat> uh, and then below that, there's the tank with regulator on it, and we're filling the balloon in the background. Um, you'll want to wear gloves uh, when you handle the balloon. It's not required, but it just helps the longevity of the balloon a bit. Um, and you'll need two people when you start. And almost as a rule, while you fill the balloon, the wind pick will pick up and bounce it around, which is entertaining. Uh, so this is a 300 gram balloon. gets about six foot tall when it's inflated on the ground. Uh, and then uh, the top right there is just before launch. We've got it all rigged up. I'm holding the payload box and just doing some last minute checks uh, before letting go. <coughs> uh, legal stuff on your flight. Uh, you're not allowed to have your cell phone transmit uh, according to the FAA and FCC. <coughs> um, never heard anyone gone after about any of these rules, but it never hurts. What was that? Yeah, you can't have your a cell phone on the balloon connecting to the cellular network. <coughs> That's a no-no. Um, APRS, you'll need an amateur radio license. Um, the, all the braking you use has to have a 30-pound braking force. Um, and again, this is assuming that you're doing an unregulated launch, which just makes a lot less paperwork. Uh, you're limited to uh, a six-pound payload box max, uh, and only two of those per balloon, <coughs> um, uh, which works out to weight-to-size weight to ratio of three ounces per square inch. Uh, there's a certain there's density limits so that you're not basically dropping a lead ball from 100,000 feet uh, You can't launch within I think it's 10 miles of an airport uh, major population center or military base uh, Landing you can't really control that so we've had some land or land uh, on a wind farm uh, right next to the largest power substation in California on a military base uh, yeah, so it, it does happen. <coughs> uh, and the relevant rules are the uh, part FAA Part 101 and FCC 22.295. Um, uh, launching in the valley here, uh, generally nobody cares if you go wander onto their farm. It definitely helps a lot if you have students wearing student, like, college shirts. People ask a lot less questions. <coughs> um, but I've never had any trouble with trespassing. Uh, and yeah, here's uh, one of the shots from one of our flights. That's the Central Valley, uh, probably from about twenty to thirty thousand feet, if I had to guess. Um, and that's about it. And then you go and pick it up later. <coughs> yeah, I use uh, APRS. Uh, to transmit data. Uh, I'll bring one out. Uh, he also says don't use APRS to track weather balloons. Um, so he's an angry old man who can cram it. Uh, it was designed for uh, weather stations to report data over the amateur radio network. Um, so yes, uh, that's uh, one of the trackers. Um, <coughs> on the back side, uh, the one without the orange wires coming out of it, there's a small silver can, and that is a temperature, pressure, humidity sensor. Um, so that's your scientific payload. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, there's this uh, small silver can on the back. Is it the square one? Yes, the square one.
Yeah, that's it. So combo combo sensor. Uh, the combo sensor? No. Uh, actually, oh. Did I, did I change it? Okay. Mike, it's, it's transmitting on the amateur bands, its location, primarily. Uh, so you right. Data you want to mm. But then you also want to go back and, okay. and retrieve it. <clears throat> uh, sorry, one more time. I was fiddling. Well, you, um, so you're getting some real time data right. dur during the launch, and then you go back and retrieve it always? Or uh, I try to always retrieve it. It's just less expensive. <clears throat> uh, if I can recover my payload, then flights cost uh, hydrogen plus a balloon, uh, which is 30 bucks for the balloons I use, and then. Uh, thirty dollars worth of hydrogen, versus a two hundred dollar tracker and about a hundred dollar tracker, plus whatever camera. So you know you're looking at six seven hundred dollars difference. Mm -hmm. um, What's the camera that looks like? <coughs> oh yeah, I'll just bring that out. Yeah, just the one camera. I, I don't really care about the camera. Uh, what was that? Seems yes, uh, both of those things are kind of luxury items. <coughs> um, the satellite tracker uses the Iridium satellite network. Um, so every 10 minutes you get a report of your footprint on a map, which is very unhelpful because you don't know where you are relative to that with that tracker, uh, which makes life difficult. APRS.APRS.HS. That track is downloadable, it's paying enough? <coughs> uh, yes, you can, okay. from APRS.FI. I didn't know that was available. Um, so here we go. Now everybody can see it on the big screen. This is actually an older version. Uh, you've got the actual one. This is more for the stream. Um, <coughs> Uh, I forgot what the question was, or if there even was one. The antenna. Lightweight solution. Uh, you're certainly, there's a SMA connector on here, so you could swap out the dipole for whatever specific antenna you prefer. Um, but this is probably the easiest, most light way to do it. And you have, is that just hanging loose off the balloon? Uh, I generally use uh, servo pushrod tubes. They're just kind of big plastic straws uh, sticking out of the payload box that hold it <coughs> stretched out. Um, ideally, uh, most repeaters are vertically polarized, so you would have it set up vertically. Uh, but the losses are minimal enough that running it horizontal is just easier. If this needs extra data into the green to hit the field, mm -hmm. uh, can that be picked up by APR? Yeah. Uh, so if we look at. Um, oh, yeah, of course it can, yeah. Can the. Does, it, does that show up in the. Um, yeah. Uh, so if I look at somebody else who uh, didn't change my call sign, um, so it's a little. We can turn the light on. Uh, um. So uh, you can see there's my call sign, the dash 11 notes that it's a balloon, and so I could potentially have multiple of these. 
um, the data. So I get time and date, uh, current altitude, and then in the comment here, this section is where I can put my extra data. So I have uh, the max altitude, the current pressure, the current relative humidity, and the current temperature, as well as the battery level. So that encoding is all your encoding, right? Like, there's no set weight. Do you have just data fields you can just dump stuff into? Uh, there is a comment field that you can just poop stuff into. So, yeah. So the, that's just... Do you know how just, long those records are held on APRS.fi? Uh, three years. So, like, everything you've done in three years that's been reported to them? Yeah, so if I look back in 2017... Uh, shoot, I have to. Uh, uh, that was a very long time ago. Uh, here we go. So here's a, a test from when I was first getting V2 ready to sell. Um, so yeah, I can go back and grab this. What's the dash 11 by your call sign? <coughs> so uh, you can have multiple. Uh, so I could be using at the same time dash 2, dash 3, dash 5, and it would show up as unique ide uh, identities in APRS.fi. Do you transmit that with your call sign from the text or? Yes. So yeah, dash 11 is appended uh, in the transmission. Uh, is there a limit to how long that could be? The call sign? Uh, the stuff you add on to the call sign? I believe it's limited to three or four characters. Uh, and the dash 11 specifically tells it to give it this balloon icon. Uh, dash 5 gives it a cell phone icon. Uh, so somebody else like made <coughs> the standard? Yeah, there's a whole table of them, and there are some very silly ones. Uh, yeah? So I'm still not clear on when you talk about regulated versus unregulated. Are you going up high enough as airplanes? Yes. Uh, so a regulated flight is if you're spe uh, sending a payload over six pounds, uh, you are sending a payload up at night without uh, very bright lights. There's actually specific uh, rules on that. Um, then you would have to be a regulated one, which means you have to file with the FAA uh, ahead of time a full flight plan. And yeah, it's a lot of paperwork. Yes. Uh, although in the uh, what seventy years, I think they've been sending up weather balloons daily from multiple uh, weather stations around the world. There's never been an interaction with an airplane recorded. So it it it's come. I've seen a couple of videos where they're within a few hundred feet of an airliner, but. Um, I'm not familiar with that. But you won't really have a way to control the, the, the maximum altitude, right? <coughs> it's just a sort of um, latex necessarily. Right? So uh, there is actually, in the Part 101 regulations, you have to have a cutdown device. Uh, generally, the balloon popping itself is considered a cutdown device. Uh, otherwise, there's lots of clever mechanisms you can use. Um, but you could specifically have a cutdown at a set altitude. Right. Yeah. So I, the lowest I've had is uh, sixty thousand feet, and the highest was one hundred and thirteen thousand. Uh, so it depends on a whole series of things. Um. Yeah. Anything else? No? All right. Um, uh, KI-6 BBK. <coughs> um, so yeah, uh, I also make and sell the Traxor, and all the money goes to the space, so if you ever want to do a weather balloon launch, I suggest that. Um, and where do we get one? Traxor.com. Uh, how do you sell, sell Traxor? Uh, 
like this. There we go. Yeah, uh, there was a guy, and I forget his call sign now. I might have it still saved on APRES.FI. Uh, I do. <coughs> uh, so this guy was supposed to uh, fly a balloon into a hurricane. He made it uh, into Pennsylvania. He started from Maine. And then never heard from him again, so I'm assuming oh. it didn't go well. Um. Yeah. some strange. <coughs> well, so uh, GPS is only accurate to within 30-ish feet for civilian stuff. Uh, so even if it's sitting perfectly still, it will think that it's moved and it can bounce around. So yeah, if we looked. What program would you use to listen to the uh, frequency if you were straight in the, uh, in the desert? So well, so one. What would you use? What frequency? In, in, other, in other words, if you want to listen to. The APRS locally. Right. Not via the repeater. Oh, okay. What would you, what program would you use? Uh, so I like APRS Droid. APRS Droid. Yeah, it costs $5, but it's an app on your phone. <coughs> and. Uh, APRS Droid. Yeah, so any Android phone. Um, and the way of, you can use it a few ways, but the way I like to use it is acoustically coupling it to mm -hmm. my radio. So I just hold it up to the speaker and it's able to demodulate it that way. Um, I have no idea. Uh, there's also a pocket packet if you use uh, iPhones. 